Hello, this is Keith Kaiser with another word of wisdom from the Gospel according to Mark. And today we're continuing in Mark chapter 8. We'll start at verse 34. Mark 8 and 34. Speaking of our Lord Jesus, it says, When he had called the people to himself with his disciples also, he said to them, Whoever desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever desires to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospel's will save it. For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? For whoever is ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of him the Son of Man also will be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels." And he said to them, Assuredly, I say to you, that there are some standing here who will not taste death till they see the kingdom of God present with power. Now our Lord in the vicinity of Caesarea Philippi, as Matthew 16 in the parallel account gives us, is just been has just been speaking to the disciples about what's going to come to pass and about how they're going up to Jerusalem. He's going to be rejected by men, uh, the leaders of his nation specifically delivered to the Gentiles and be killed. And several times before going up to Jerusalem, our Lord tells the disciples this. Now their attitude is kind of like, La 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 la, can't hear you. You know, they stick their fingers in their ears almost because they thought that kind of talk was defeatist. I mean, they were thinking about who's going to be the greatest in the kingdom. And they were arguing among themselves about what plum jobs they would have when the Lord Jesus went up to Jerusalem and toppled the Romans and toppled all the people that were against him and set up his kingdom right then and there which we know the Lord didn't do. He came at his first coming not to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. So says John 3. And our Lord came, of course, to first of all deal with sin at the cross of Calvary. The cross must precede the crown. The Lord will reign in glory, but as he said in Luke 24, ought not the Christ to have suffered these things and to have entered into his glory. That's certainly the pattern of Old Testament prophecy, and it's the recurring theme in the Gospels and later in the Epistles as well. Now the Apostles uh, themselves struggled to get that at first, and Peter, uh, being the most vocal of them, took the Lord aside and rebuked him, and the Lord had to tell him that he wasn't speaking with the right perspective. It wasn't the heavenly way of viewing things, but Peter was actually giving voice to something that was satanic. In other words, it was that which was adversarial or in opposition to the Lord, because the name Satan means the adversary. And there is a personal devil that the Lord Jesus uh, fought with and interacted with against in the Gospels already we've seen. Uh, And it should make us wary that even believers can be duped. Even we can be deceived. And sometimes when we think we're saying the right thing, uh, we can actually be saying something that is contrary to God's will, as Peter shows us here. Now, thankfully, God has given us his word. And unlike Peter, we have the indwelling Holy Spirit today. The Spirit was working among them. John 14, he says, he has been with you, but he shall be in you. Now we have him in us, And it still doesn't safeguard us away from making errors and mistakes. That's why we got to put our minds before the Lord and immerse ourselves in the scriptures and say, Lord, teach us, show us your will, and put a guard about our lips that we don't say the wrong thing. And even then, we'll probably and and assuredly have opportunity to fall and have to go and confess that before the Lord who wonderfully restores us and, as John 13 shows, spiritually washes our feet. Now, we pick up today then with the same incident, and in the next breath, the Lord tells the people and the disciples also there, whoever desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. So it's not just that the Lord is going to go forward to Jerusalem and be rejected and be killed. His death is going to be the death of a cross which was the most shameful death in the ancient world. That to the Jews, it meant you were under the curse of God. Deuteronomy 21, 23 says, Cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. And Galatians 3 quotes that regarding the Lord Jesus. And so the Lord was made a curse for us 
but this was horrid to their minds, that the Lord would be rejected by his own nation and crucified. And to the Romans, uh, as their ancient orator Cicero once said, we don't even speak about crucifixion in polite company. So it was something that to them, again, was abominable. It was reserved for the worst dregs of society. And ordinarily, the historians tell us, they didn't crucify Roman citizens. That's probably why church tradition tells us that Paul was beheaded, because he was a Roman citizen, whereas Peter was crucified. He wasn't a Roman citizen, as far as anyone knows, at least. In any case, uh, the Lord here makes it clear, not only is he going to suffer that death of rejection, but if one wants to be his disciple, to be a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ, that they have to, as he says, come after him. So there has to be an obedience, a following of Christ. There has to be, of course, a denial of self, and there has to be a taking up of the cross. Well, as one has said, that a man carrying a cross in the ancient world was going to do one thing. He was going to die. And that a person following the Lord Jesus is saying, I'm not going to live for my life and what I can gain in this world. I'm living for the Lord Jesus Christ. I want to belong to him. I'm even going to identify with him in his sorrows and in his sufferings, as Paul would put it later in Philippians 3.10, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being made conformable unto his death. So there had to be this self-denial and taking up of the cross and following the Lord Jesus. Now, some people have tried to make a distinction or a dichotomy between discipleship and being a believer. They say you can be a believer in Christ, but sometime later you become a disciple in Christ. Uh, in other words, that they think that being a disciple, a learner of the Lord Jesus, is somehow distinct from a believer. And, and it becomes something like this, that believer, that's track A. You want fire insurance? You want to be saved from hell? Well, become a believer in Christ. Ask Jesus to save you from that. But you really don't have to deny yourself or follow him. You know, you can kind of live your own way and the Lord will pick you up at the end of your life, be that by rapture or be that by physical death. The Lord will receive you to himself. And yet when you study through the New Testament, the concept of belief in Christ and being born again, discipleship is part and parcel of it. Now, when the Lord Jesus calls us to be his children, to come and follow him, he's calling us to die to ourselves, to turn our back on that old life. That's what repentance is. We're turning from the way we used to live independently of God. We're seeing ourselves the way God sees us, as sinners, hopelessly lost. And we realize that if we're to be saved, the only way God can have mercy on us and save us is by the death of his son, the one who sacrificed himself on the cross of Calvary. And just as he was rejected in this world, and we are not to be conformed to this world, as Romans 12, 2 says, we are to live a life that is transformed by the renewing of our minds, that we might approve the will of God and so forth, that this new life we live is a life that is obedience to Christ. There's no such thing as a believer who's not a disciple, or for that matter, of a disciple that's not a believer. There are disciples spoken of in the New Testament in, in the Gospels, people who followed Jesus physically, but it came to be found out that they weren't really genuine. Just as sometimes in the Bible, the word believer is used of someone, and later you find out they didn't really believe. They said they believed, and the Word of God kind of treats them on their profession, but when it comes down to it, they didn't have true faith in Christ. And Judas Iscariot was one such example. We can look back at the generation of Israel in the wilderness that didn't go into the land. The majority of them fell into that category. But really what the Lord is after is believers who believe. And believers who believe are also disciples. They're followers of the Lord. And they imitate Christ in that they don't want this world. They say, take the world but give me Jesus. They want to live for the Lord. They want to live for the next world. And they're willing to deny themselves and take up the cross, not to take the easy road for themselves and to live for what they can get out of this world and live for the here and now. The world tells us all the time, you only go around once, so get the best of this world. Now he says, whoever desires to save his life will lose it. So you try to aim 
for the best in this world and living your best life now, guess what? You're going to lose it in the world to come. Now, of course, that's a principle with believers that you can be a believer in Christ and you can fritter away opportunities and time for the Lord. And there will be rewards that you lose through that. You'll be one of those described by 1 Corinthians 3 as save so as by fire. You don't want to be that. Um, but at a deeper level, the unbeliever sees their very reason for living, their, their whole life, basically burning up before their eyes, not really being able to enjoy the next life at all, because they'll be cast out of the Lord's presence into outer darkness, as Mark is going to tell us in the next chapter. But in any case, he says the person who loses his life for my sake and the Gospels will save it. You turn from this world and say, I want to follow you, Lord Jesus. Guess what? The Lord is going to give you in the world, uh, in the world to come, rather, in heaven, so much more than what you've given up here. You've given up momentary pleasures for eternal joys in the presence of God. You've given up maybe a fame in this world for being associated in glory with the Creator, the Son of God Himself, and with God the Father and the Spirit. He says, what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? If you could have it all, if you could gain everything, you've bedded every woman, you've driven every fast car, you've got all the money in the world in the bank, what is it worthwhile if it's just for this short world? As the missionary C.T. Studd put it in a little poem, only one on life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. So you think about all these people living for this world and trying to get more and more and more. The Lord says that's not going to profit them at all. Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? For whoever is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation. So that's the way of the world. It's adulterous. It's unfaithful to their creator. And it's sinful. It's characterized by that which rebels against God and falls short of his glory. And if you're ashamed of the Lord Jesus and his words in this world that exemplifies that, when the Son of Man comes in his glory with his angels, he's going to be ashamed of you too. What a horrible thing to hear the Son of God say to you, depart from me, I never knew you. Now the idea here is that this is a person not willing to confess Christ, not willing to come to Christ and saying, my Lord and my God, I want you to be my Lord and Savior. I want to follow you. This is a person that lives for this world. And so they're ashamed of Jesus. They devalue him. They don't give him glory and honor. He is not their Lord. And therefore, when the Lord comes, they're lost. But there were exceptions there. He said to them, Assuredly, I say to you, there are some standing here who will not taste death till they see the kingdom of God present with power. And the next story is going to give us a preview of what the kingdom is going to be like, what believers are going to see, what they're going to enjoy. And this was going to make such an impression on Peter that decades later in 2 Peter 1, he's still talking about the glory which he saw and the voice which he heard that vouchsafed to him the truth of what the Lord Jesus was saying, and that this kingdom really is coming and that it's worth living for. And so... May you turn from this world to the Lord Jesus. May you say, Lord, I want you. I'd rather have Jesus than silver and gold. I'd rather have Jesus than riches untold. I'd rather have him than worldwide fame. I'd rather be true to his holy name. May God help you to honor and to obey the Lord. And uh, may you come to him if you never have for salvation. And if you are a believer in Christ, may you indeed follow him and learn of him and take his yoke upon you, for his yoke is easy and his burden is light. Thank you for listening.